Well, today is part five of our series, Marriage, Divorce, and Singleness. Today, we are getting specifically to understanding a theology of what it means to be a person who is single today. Now, a lot of times in my role as a pastor, when you stand on a stage for 40 minutes and talk about a topic, a lot of times very countercultural topics, a lot of times I get a lot of feedback, input, correspondence after a sermon has been preached. This week, something brand new, unprecedented happened to me. This week, I got a lot of feedback before the sermon was preached. You wouldn't believe how many people contacted me this week to say, Jason, I am so glad that you're going to preach about what it means to be single this week because I've been coming to church for a while. I've heard a lot of sermons about marriage, have never heard a sermon about being single. So thank you for giving us some props. We appreciate that. And here's what really surprised me at first. Almost everyone who contacted me followed that up with something. And what they followed it up with was this, and I'm scared. I said, scared, what do you mean? About, about whatever you're going to say, I'm, I'm just scared about it, just so you know. Now, when I thought about it, it actually made quite a bit of sense because in our culture, we build so much of our personal identity around our relationship status. Okay, for example, if you go to the optometrist and you're filling out your medical form, what do they want to know? Are you married, divorced, or single? And you're thinking to yourself, I just need some new contact lenses. But, but thank you for reminding me that I don't have a date on Friday night. Single, there you go. Um, so there's that pressure as you're doing your taxes this spring, you know, you're reminded, oh, I'm sorry, you're not married? Well, we have a special tax bracket just for you. Have fun with that. Uh, so there's that pressure. When you're at a family reunion, if you're, if you're single, oh man, that, that, that's worse than water torture because, so, you know, the, there's some relatives who kind of casually, subtly bring it up. So are you dating anyone? And then there's grandma. She's lost, she lost subtly back in the 80s and she just, you know, she, she asks you point blank, you know, is there anyone, are there any prospects, any hopes? And, and after a while, we become so identified with the relationship status, some of those fears begin to creep in. Okay, for some of you who are single, the fear is, is there something wrong with me? Because some of you are single and you want to be single. And you say, well, maybe people think there's something wrong with me, even though I chose this lifestyle. But if you're single and you wish you were married, you wish you were with someone, then you say, maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe there's something that my family or my friends just aren't telling me. And when you're single and you want to be married, some other fears begin to creep in. Am I going to be single forever? I mean, is this all there is to my life? Am I never going to find someone to spend the rest of my life with? What if, what if I end up alone all these years? Can I handle being alone all by myself? No, really, what happens if I never meet someone? And that can be something that causes fear. For some of you, you're single, and the reason why you choose to be single is because what you fear is not being alone. What you fear is being married because your parents or your friends, they got married and it ended up being horrible, and you are just are, are repelled away from the idea of marriage because you've seen it go so badly or maybe you've been divorced, and you are afraid of marriage. So when it comes to relationship status, especially being single, not only is it something that you're really interested in hearing about from God's Word, perhaps, but also something that comes with a little bit of fear and trepidation. Now, there is a reason why I preach about marriage more than I preach about single. The reason why is, is this. Uh, if you are single, having a biblically informed view of marriage will help you be better at being single. Because if you do not have a good theology of marriage, you will tend to either over or under desire marriage. Some of you who are single, you want marriage too much and it steals your joy and ruins your contentment as a single person. Some of you desire marriage too little and that steals your joy and ruins your contentment. So when I preach about marriage, if you're single, at least understanding a theology of it helps you be better as a single person, more content and joyful in life. Well, at the same time, today when I preach about being single, those of you who are married, the applications do not apply to you today. You don't have to really do anything with what you hear today. However, having a good biblical theology of being single will help those of you who are married have a better understanding of how to do well at being married. So to get things kicked off, I want to talk about how our culture shapes our understanding of what it means to be single today. Now, generally speaking, in traditional cultures, uh, whether it's Eastern cultures or even in our own nation several generations back, in traditional cultures, 
we tend to make an idol out of family. We tend to make an idol and build an identity for ourselves around our place in the family, around having a legacy, around having heirs, around having people to carry on the family name, and that tends to become an idol in traditional cultures. In modern cultures, we tend to make an idol out of individual fulfillment, individual happiness, and individual satisfaction. As a result, in modern cultures, marriage has largely been dismissed, especially in the millennial generation, those beneath the age of 30. It's seen as an institution that is no longer necessary and can, in fact, get in the way of personal satisfaction and happiness. So it's disposable in in modern cultures. Take it or leave it. What is not disposable in modern cultures is our desire for romance and finding meaning through romance and sexuality. Now, I'm going to talk about this next week, but what's unprecedented about our culture is this. No other culture in the history of the world has used human sexuality in the way that we do as a tool to define identity and self-expression. So even if you have rejected the category of marriage as a single person, we still desire romance in our lives. So we have these two cultural forces driving us and informing our view of marriage. Uh, And where we live in in Lake Country, uh, we have both cultures at work. Because while America is a modern culture and it's all about individual fulfillment and happiness and your rights as an individual... At the same time, as far away as we live from any major influential cities, I mean, Milwaukee's not that big and we're pretty far away from it, you have more traditional views. And, and as a result, if you're single, you're, you're, just, you're just stuck in the middle of all bad cultures because either you're, you're, you're single and something's wrong with you because you should have a, a, a wedding and a family, or you're single and something's wrong with you because you're not finding fil- fulfillment. Either way, uh, being single in any culture can make you at times feel subhuman and devalued. What's fascinating, however, is as we open the Bible and see what it says about being single, we discover that once again, the biblical perspective is completely countercultural to every culture. There, there is no culture that really fully embraces this biblical value. However, what we discover today is that the biblical perspective on being single elevates and validates the status of being single, like no culture and like no religion does. In fact, what we discover today is that the Bible upholds singleness as a God-honoring way to choose to do your life. And it upholds that and champions that as a viable way and path to pursue through life. And what we find in the Bible is how to pursue that in a healthy way that leaves you with a sense of contentment and fulfillment and peace in your heart and peace with God. Well, we find that today in a New Testament book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was a letter written by a guy named Paul. If you were here earlier in the series, we also looked at what Paul said in a book of the Bible called Ephesians. Now, earlier in the series, he held up this model of marriage that really exalted the view of marriage. He said, well, marriage, it's, it's like Christ loving the church and husbands are, are to be like Jesus and sacrifice themselves for their wives and wives are, are, to, are to respect and, and follow the leadership of their husband like Jesus submits to the will of the Father and just holds up this very exalted and glorified view of marriage. Today, however, what he says seems to completely contradict and undermine what he wrote in Ephesians. Because he speaks so despairingly of marriage and so glowingly of being single, we're like, is this the same guy and can these two ideas possibly reconcile to one another? So we're going to see what he wrote today in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to begin at verse 27. Here's what Paul wrote here. He says, are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. Let's close in prayer, everyone. (laughs) That's all we need to say. You single? Great. Be single. But, he says, if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, he has not sinned. So just so you know, okay, okay. if you got married, technically you didn't sin. You're fine. But, But if you're single awesome. Stay single. And we're like, well, wait a minute. This is the guy who last time said marriage is awesome and it's amazing and it's like Jesus. And now he says, yeah, stay single. All right. Why? Here's why. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you of this. You're not supposed to laugh at that part. (laughs) 
but that was all the single people because they have married friends. I want to spare you of this. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. Here's what he's getting at. Although in Genesis, we saw the last couple of weeks how God looked at man in the beginning and there was no sin in the world and the world was perfect. And he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And I even had my cool little illustration about how, you know, you have a pane of glass and you have aluminum foil, neither make a good reflection, but you bring them together in a mirror and you see a good reflection. God made a man and a woman to come together as one flesh and together they reflect the image and glory of God. And you're like, well, well, if that's how it's supposed to be, how can we say, that it's better not to get married. If you're, if you're single, don't look for a spouse. What's that all about? Well, here's what we can derive from that. Here's what we can conclude. If we lived in a world where there was no sin, I think it's safe to say that marriage would be the preferred avenue to go through life in. If there was a world still like the Garden of Eden, no sin, no pain, no crying, no, no, none of that, yeah, it looks like the answer is get married. It's the plan God has. However, Paul understands rightly that it's not a perfect world. It's a fallen world. It's a sin-filled world filled with sinful men and sinful women. And he says, if you choose to get married, you're, you're not sinning, but if you choose to get married, it will bring trouble. I would like to spare you of trouble. Now, that's where you can agree with Paul, no matter what your background. I, too, would like to spare myself from trouble. How do I do that? Paul says, the reason why you should really consider staying single if you're single is because getting married in a fallen world will lead to troubles. This is just the way it is. He paints a very realistic picture of marriage. The second reason why he gives that you should really consider staying single is this. The time is short. Now, he explains what that means in the very next paragraph. Look what he wrote next about the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. So the men are like, so I should start having beer for breakfast? No. Let him, let him finish his thought, then you'll understand what he means. Those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed by them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Here's what Paul is doing. He's taking a remarkably mature theology and he is applying it specifically to single men and single women. Here's the mature theology he's applying. In their generation, the Jewish people thought that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come once, he's going to bring in the kingdom of God, he's going to put an end to oppression, an end to injustice, an end to tyranny, an end to everything wrong, and everything will be made right. What they didn't realize is that Jesus the Messiah did not plan on only coming once, but on coming twice. The first time he came in the first century world, he did come to put an end to sin. But he did not come to bring judgment on the earth. He came to bear the judgment of the earth. He came to live as your substitute and to die as your substitute. He came to pay the penalty of your sins before God on the cross. He came to atone for the sins of the world. And when he left, ascended back into heaven, he said, I'm going to come back again. And the second time when I come, then I will bring the consummation of the kingdom of God. I already began the kingdom of God. It is already. You can already, through repentance and faith, have all your sins forgiven, have everything made right with God. Through faith in Christ, God looks at you and says... You've already had your own personal judgment day. You are acquitted. You are declared righteous all through faith in Christ, not because of what you've done, because of what he's done. The kingdom of God is already here and you've entered into it through faith in Christ. But the kingdom of God is also not yet. We're still waiting for the final consummation of the kingdom when all pain is done away with, when all sin is done away with, when Satan is locked up forever, when there is no more crying or mourning or pain, when we are free from everything that is tainted by the effects of sin. 
Paul says we live at a very unique time in history between the first and second coming of Jesus. What that means is, very practically speaking, we do not get too wrapped up in the things of this world because while we have entered the kingdom of God through faith, we are still waiting for the final consummation of the kingdom of God, always looking forward to our future. What that means is we still buy, we still sell, we still have jobs, we still laugh and have fun, we still mourn and grieve when things make us sad, but we do those things in light of the future reality of the kingdom of heaven. In the future, God is going to give you your ultimate wealth in the kingdom of heaven. So right now, whether you have money or not is not the biggest deal. If you have money right now, great. Don't get used to it. If you don't have any money right now, don't sweat it. It's not your true wealth. Your true wealth is in heaven. Or Uh, In the future, God will give you your ultimate home. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to go prepare a place for you and come back and take you to be with me. What that means now is this. If you have a large house right now and it's paid off and you're living in there, hey, great. If you have a tiny apartment and you can barely make the monthly payments on it, it's not the biggest deal. If you have a home, great. Don't get too attached to it. If you don't, no worries. Our true home isn't on the world. Our true home is waiting in heaven. Our ultimate health, our true health, is not to be found in this world, in your current physical body. So right now, whether you have physical health or not, isn't the biggest deal. If you have health right now, great, don't get too attached to it. If you don't have health right now, hey, it's not our ultimate or true health anywhere. Our true health is waiting to be revealed when Jesus returns and is done and does away with sin forever. So what Paul says is people who live between the times as Christians in the kingdom of God, you can weep, but don't overdo it. You can grieve, but don't overdo it. You can rejoice, but don't overdo it. Well, whatever you do in this world, do it in light of what is to come. So laugh, cry, mourn, weep, acquire, buy, sell, But don't get too engrossed in it because the present world in its present form is passing away and when Jesus returns, he will make all things new. And he will make you new as well. Now, that's the truth he's talking about, but he's applying it very specifically to the context of marriage and singleness. So what he says is, if you have a wife, from now on, live as if you do not. He's not saying get divorced and walk away from your marriage. What he's saying is this. Know that if you are married, marriage was designed to be a reflection and a reenactment of a more true and more ultimate relationship, the relationship between God and his people. In fact, in his ministry, the most common illustration, metaphor, and parable Jesus used to describe his relationship with his church, the people who believe in him. And the way he spoke about heaven was to talk about it as a wedding feast, a wedding banquet, a wedding supper. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when we're given a glimpse of what heaven is like, look at what it says about what heaven is like. Revelation chapter 19. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him, God, the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. You know who the Lamb is that's talking about Jesus? He's called the Lamb who is slain to forgive the sins of the world. It's a reference to the Old Testament sacrificial system. He's saying we worship Jesus in heaven because Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. And it says, wedding is the marriage of the Lamb, or it's the marriage of Jesus, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. The bride, that's the church, people who believe, have faith in Christ, and enter eternal life. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What is heaven? It's described as a marriage feast, as a marriage supper. That is the ultimate thing to which marriage on earth points us. Marriage is for this life, and it is there to point us, guide us, direct us, fix our minds on the true wedding feast. So here's our first fill in the blank this morning, if you're taking notes. Marriage is a good thing. We know from everything Paul wrote, he thought marriage is a good thing, not the ultimate thing. 
Marriage on earth is a good thing. It is not the ultimate thing. That means if you're married, great, you've got a good thing. It's not the ultimate thing. Jesus is the ultimate thing. By the way, if you remember as a married person that Jesus is the ultimate thing, you'll be better at being married and you'll have a more satisfying marriage. And if you're single, hey, you can be content if you choose not to seek a spouse. Why? Because marriage on earth isn't the ultimate thing anyway. You can be single without having marriage, and you are not missing out on the ultimate thing. The ultimate thing is in heaven, and if you are single, and if your life is centered on Jesus, you'll look forward to the ultimate thing to which marriage is supposed to simply point us and guide us. That's what Paul is teaching here about marriage. If you marry, hey, you're not sinning. Go ahead. You'll you'll have troubles, but you're not sinning. Go ahead. Reenact the gospel. It's a good thing. If you're single, great, don't freak out about being single. It's a good thing. But it's not the, marriage isn't the ultimate thing. Jesus is, build your life on him and live as a content, single person. Now, when Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 7, what you need to understand contextually is that this idea was absolutely unprecedented in the ancient world. No one ever thought or spoke or wrote like this about marriage and singleness before. Because again, in traditional cultures, the idol is family. You're no one until you have a legacy. You're no one until you have heirs. You're no one until you have a place in the family. In fact, what's interesting is in the first century Roman world, Tiberius Caesar made it a law that if a woman was widowed, she had to be remarried within two years or she would be subject to a fine because the Roman government did not want to have the burden of taking care of widows because women in that culture could not have jobs, own property, run businesses in the same freedom that men could. And so get married or we're going to fine you so that someone can take care of you. When widows were in the church in the first century, the church said, you don't need to get remarried. We'll take care of you. You you were dependent on your husband for survival and he died? No, no, no. Well, you you can get married if you want to, but we'll take care of you. Why? Because we're the church. That's what we do. And in the church, singleness was elevated as being equal to being married in status and acceptance in the Christian community. It's a viable way to honor God with your life. So if you want to get remarried, go for it. If you want to be single, go for it. We'll make sure you're taken care of either way. Because that's a God-honoring way to approach life. By the way, who was it that wrote these words? A guy named Paul. You know, what do you know about Paul's relationship status? He was a bachelor. Without 19 scantily clad women running around, he was a bachelor, right? Spent his whole life as a single man. Wrote those exalted things about marriage. Also wrote exalted things about being single and honoring and pursuing God with your life. It's a a great way to live, he says. Now, he spells out next, going back to 1 Corinthians 7, some of the troubles that married people are going to bump into and why it's good to be single. He says, I would like you to be free from concern, to which we say, I too would like to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. By contrast, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife and his interests are divided. So he's saying, dude's single, he does not have to worry about pleasing his wife. Dude gets married, what happens? His friends all make fun of him because now he has to go please his wife. But that's part of being married. Paul says it how it is. Yeah, if you decide to get married, you are now a divided interest person. A lot of your interest is spent serving the interest of your spouse. That's how you stay happily married. He's not saying it's wrong. He's saying it's what is. He continues, An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. Again, he's not saying that's wrong. In fact, that's how you stay happily married. You you are concerned about how you please your husband. You're concerned about how you please your wife. But his point is, now you have extra concerns. A single person does not carry that trouble. A single person does not carry that concern and therefore does not have that energy split into multiple directions. He says this, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. He said, I'm not saying you can't get married. I'm not restricting your options, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. 
What Paul wants for his single friends in the church more than anything is what he had. A life and a heart and an interest that was focused on Jesus and his gospel. To know that I do not need marriage to define me. I have already been defined by the love and by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am a whole person as a single person. I have a spiritual family even if I do not have a family by blood. I have spiritual descendants even if I do not have physical descendants. As Revelation said, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I have a spiritual family. I can find contentment as a single person. No, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just a person who's chosen to avoid the troubles of marriage. This is the reason why Paul calls marriage a gift. Look at what else he wrote in this chapter about being single. He said, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, the bachelor. But each of you has your own, look at the word he used, each of you has your own, what's the word? Gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. What he's saying is this, if you're single, there's a gift from God to you. It's the gift of being single. Now, when the New Testament talks about gifts, it always talks about something that God gives, and He gives it to you for the benefit of others. Uh, For example, when the Bible talks about spiritual gifts, it talks about the gift of teaching. Like, people say, Jason, when you open the Bible, I I understand it. You know, I don't understand it. When you talk about it, I I get it. That's, That's a spiritual gift of teaching. It wasn't given for my benefit. It's given for the benefit of the church. Whenever there's a gift given by God to someone, he says, one gets this gift, one gets that gift. Uh... It's given for the benefit of the church. Paul says, I was given the gift of singleness, so I use that gift from God in order to benefit and serve others. He says, in the same way, I wish all of you had this gift. I know some of you don't. Some of you either got married or some of you, if you're single, you do feel the need to be married. But if you have this gift, it should be used for the benefit of others. His his point is simply this, and we overlook this easily. Singleness is a gift from God. It really is a gift that God gives to people. Now, the reason why we don't see it as a gift has to do with idolatry. Idolatry happens in our hearts when we love something or someone more than God, when we trust something or someone more than God, when we build a sense of personal identity and well-being around something or someone more than God, when we fear something or someone more than God. In traditional cultures, the idol becomes family. I'm nobody till I have a family. In modern cultures, the idol becomes personal satisfaction and fulfillment. You're no one until you've accomplished something. You're no one till someone loves you. Somehow, Christians today manage to succumb to both forms of idolatry, which is being single, hating themselves for being single, while sleeping around with people trying to find someone to love them. Seriously, you've fallen into all kinds of idolatry with that one. Paul says it's time to reorient our thinking. Center your life and your well-being and your contentment and your wholeness on Jesus, on the future yet to come when He returns, and see your singleness as a gift that He gives to be a blessing to the world. It is a gift. You say, but... I I see it's a gift. Okay, fine. I see my interests are not divided. But Jason, I feel so lonely. So you're throwing yourself at people. You're pursuing relationships in an unhealthy or in an ungodly way. And what I will submit to you is this. It is better to see singleness as a gift and be lonely than it is to succumb to idolatry, end up in a marriage you should not be in, and feel lonely in a bad marriage. It is worse to be married and lonely than it is to be single and lonely. Learn to build your single life on Christ. Root your identity in Him. And then if you choose, you can pursue marriage in a way in which you are healthy and whole as a person and will lead to blessing in your life. Now, before we wrap up, uh, what I want to spend the, the remainder of our time doing is having a little session that I call Life Lessons with Pastor Jason. Every once in a while, uh, I bring my kids around the kitchen table and I say, kids, come here. It's time to, talk, time to have a family talk, kids. And I say, it's time to have life lessons with dad. And what I do with life lessons with dad is I tell them a story about something that happened to someone at church. Now, I change the names to protect the innocent and the guilty most times. 
And I, and I, because as a pastor, I get a front row seat to all kinds of heartbreak. You would not imagine the kind of heartbreak I witness as a pastor. And people come to church and, and, and we want you to come. If you've jacked up your life, you are so welcome here. We want you here if you have jacked up your life and we want to help you with that. But people will come to me and then they'll, they'll tell their story. And, and I think to myself, and sometimes they'll even say, I wish, I wish I knew this before. I, I preach so many sermons where someone will say, I wish I knew that 10 years ago. And I think to myself, man, I want to make sure my kids know that before they go out and start their adult life. So I say, kids, come here. It's time for life lessons with dad. And I'll tell them a story about what someone else wished someone had told them. And I make sure my kids know. Well, today you're getting life lessons with Pastor Jason, all right? What I'm going to share with you about being a single person, some of these I have verses for, some of them, and I'll tell you up front, I do not have verses for, okay? So you can disagree with me on some of these, but it's what I've seen being a pastor for years and years and years, how single people have made horrible mistakes that they regretted after the fact. So, sounds like fun. Being a single person, life lessons with Pastor Jason, everybody ready to get scolded and feel like you're nine years old? Okay, here we go. All right. Here's some practical counsel on being single. First is this. Seek maturity through service. Seek maturity through service. Here's what I mean by that. When a person gets married, they are now in a relationship that demands that they are constantly serving someone. When you get married, if you're going to be happily married, you constantly must serve your spouse in order to be happily married. So you've entered a covenantal relationship where there is always someone who demands your service. That's good for your character. It matures you because it makes you more humble. It matures your faith as you serve someone in love. It's good to serve because maturing, serving matures us as people and as Christians. When you are single... You are not in that kind of relationship where you are forced to serve someone constantly. If there is a relationship where you need to serve one, you can back out of it. If it's a friendship, if it's a family relationship, you have nothing to compare to this. Seek out ways to serve people because that's going to help develop your character and your Christian faith. That might mean volunteering at a charity regularly, getting involved with it. It might mean volunteering through your local church or in a Christian ministry. It might mean that there's just a little old lady who lives on the corner and she doesn't have family to take care of her. You take responsibility and you're going to take care of her. If you are single, make sure you structure service into your life even when you don't feel like it because that's part of the maturing process that will help round you out as a single person. Next one is this. There are times for not seeking marriage. Some of you are single. You say, okay, I see I have equal validation in my life as a married person. I'm not weird. Perfectly acceptable in God's eyes and in the eyes of the church. However, if you want to seek marriage, you're not sinning like Paul said, have at it. But be aware that there are seasons in which you should not seek marriage. Now, I don't have a verse for this. I'm just going from what I've seen as a pastor. If you have gone through a major transition in life, new job, new school, new major, moving, new community, take a time off from dating. In emotional seasons of life, your judgment is clouded and you cannot see a person objectively enough to enter a serious relationship with them. So recognize those seasons. Now I'm going to drill down on two specifically. First one is this. If you're a new Christian, you're new to Jesus, you're new to Christianity, I highly, highly, highly recommend you take a year off of dating. And let me explain why. I don't think there's any area of life where the Christian approach and the non-Christian approach to something could be more diametrically opposed to one another. I think this is the epitome of difference when it comes to dating. If you're a, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but if you're a new Christian, I recommend you take a year, focus and root your faith and your thinking in Jesus, and then you can re-engage with a new perspective on what it means to be a Christian single man or a Christian single woman who is looking for marriage, and you will go about it in a much healthier way. Second time to take a season off is if you are recently divorced. If you have gone through a divorce, again, I don't have a verse for this. This is just what I've seen. Do not date, from the time your papers are signed, do not date a person for at least two years, preferably three. Because going through a divorce is a time of incredible emotional upheaval. 
no matter what the circumstances were that prompted it, it's a time of upheaval and you will not have good judgment. Take some time off. Get rooted in Jesus. Then as you have found contentment, satisfaction, and joy in Him, if you desire remarriage again, then you can wade back into that pool. Uh, but not before then is my recommendation. All right? Next one is this. Learn to date wisely. Learn how to be wise when it comes to dating. Now, the Bible says nothing about dating because it didn't exist in the first century world. They had arranged marriages. You know, you were growing up, you were betrothed to someone else, and that was just the way it is. You meet them, and now you're married. There you go. Kind of like popping the clutch. Boom. Uh, you're off and driving. So, in our world, how do we approach dating in a wise way when there's no biblical counsel on it? Well, let me give you a brief overview of dating in the last 150 years of our culture. At the end of the 19th century, dating did not exist. We had courting and we had calling. What would happen was a young woman had the prerogative to initiate a man calling on her. She would pick a man, invite him over, and a young man would come over to her family's home, and either on their front porch, in their parlor, in some room of the home, he would sit with the young woman, her mother, her father, his friend, Smith, Wesson. They would all get together and have a conversation. And when it was time to go home, the daughter stayed with the family. The boy went home. As a result... Courting was about character assessment, about developing friendship, about testing the quality of a person in the woman's environment. Around the turn of the 20th century, in fact, the first time we find that the word date or dating in print is in 1914, the rules changed. Now, instead of the man going to the woman's home, the man would take the woman out of her home and the goal was no longer character assessment and friendship. The goal became, let's spend money and do something entertaining. Let's go have fun. So the goal became, let's have fun, not let's get to know if this person is good marriage material or not. And it took the woman and her family out of control and it put the young man in control and began to put new pressure on the woman that didn't exist in the 19th century. Those of you who are about the age, about age 30 and over, uh, this, is what you, this is the world you inherited, the world of dating. But around the turn of the 21st century, the rules all changed again. What is happening very rapidly now is modern dating as we know it is quickly evaporating and it is being replaced with the hookup culture. The hookup culture has emerged because young men and young women have grown to realize that members of the opposite sex can be difficult, challenging, and frustrating to communicate with. So it's a new approach where you completely skip courtship, completely skip getting to know someone, and go straight to the sex. There's apps for this, there's a culture for this, it's becoming more and more commonplace in our society. Now, there are no guarantees, promises, or obligations with the sexual relationship. After the hookup, you can start dating if you want to, but the hookup is not dependent on that actually happening. As a result, we are now entering into unprecedented territory when it comes to romance in our culture. There is no established and universal cultural way for two people to come together and discover whether or not they should be married. As a result, dating is becoming incredibly complicated with enormous pressures that never, ever existed before. As a result, we need to become men and women, if you're single, who know how to date wisely. What I share with you next are a bunch of points on how to date wisely. First one is this, act your age. If you're 17 years old and you just want to have fun, great. That's perfectly appropriate at 17 years old. You just need someone to go to the prom with. That You're not going to marry the person. They're just someone with a decent reputation and they're a respectful person. Hey, fine, go to the prom, have fun. But when you're 37 or 47... The expectation of the relationship has changed dramatically and you need to be very honest and transparent about what your intentions of the relationship are right off the bat pretty much. If you're seeking marriage, you need to be honest. I'm seeking marriage. If you're not seeking marriage, you need to be transparent. I just want someone to go to the movies with, but act your age when you're dating. Next one's this. Ladies. Ladies, ladies, ladies. All the single ladies. 
Do not, 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 do not act like a commodity. You know what a commodity is? Something you buy, something you sell, something you trade in when it wears out. Don't act like a commodity. Ladies, you are God's redeemed daughter. Do not act like a commodity. You know how a fisherman knows how to bait his hook? It depends on what he wants to catch. Some of you ladies, you dress like you're a commodity. And guess what kind of man you're catching? A pig. Strangest thing. If you bait the hook with your body, you're going to catch a pig. Some of you ladies, you say, ah, oh, all men are the same, they're all pigs. They're not, actually. You keep catching the same kind of man because of the way you bait your hook. What if you decided, I'm going to bait my hook with my mind? You know what kind of man you'll catch if you bait the hook with your mind? The guy who's into your imagination and your thoughts. You know what happens if you bait your hook with your love and service and devotion to God? You know what kind of man you catch then? Dude who loves Jesus. And he respects you because you serve Jesus. And that's going to be a man you can trust. Ladies, you're God's daughter. Do not cheapen yourself. Do not dress or act like you are just a commodity. You have value and dignity and worth in the eyes of your Father in heaven. Act that way. Next one is this. Non-Christians. So this is for those of you, you're not a Christian, but you ended up at church this morning. Non-Christians... Don't get emotionally involved with a Christian unless you plan on becoming one, okay? If you're dating a Christian right now, they're going to be mad that I'm telling you this, but I feel like someone should tell you the truth. They will not accept you just the way you are. They want you to change. And they might say it's okay while you're dating, but if you get married and you are not a Christian, they will not be content to let you stay a non-Christian. And especially once the kids come, look out because they are going to be dragging you to church. So unless you plan on becoming a Christian, non-Christians, you would be better off if you didn't date a Christian or get emotionally involved with a Christian because it's going to come to that. Christians, if you date and get married to a non-Christian, here's what you need to know. If your life is centered on Jesus, what that means is the person you get married to cannot fully understand who you are at the center of your being. The center of who you are will be opaque to them. They will not, you will not have transparency at that point in your relationship, which means you will always find a little bit of friction, a little bit of, uh, of, of the intimacy is, is distanced because you cannot have full intimacy and transparency because they will not understand who and what is at the center of your values if you marry a non-Christian. Be aware of that. Be wise with that. Next this. Delay the physical as long as possible. Great intimacy comes by building true intimacy with God and with each other through character and friendship, delay the physical, it will lead to greater intimacy in the marriage. Submit to lots of third-party input. What that means is this, when, when, when you come in and you, the relationship starts and you're in love and, and it's amazing and, and she can't stop talking about him and he can't keep his hands off her and oh, love, 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 get third-party input. What does your family say? What do your friends say? What does your group say? What does your pastor say? Get third party. Is this a person that is a wise person for you to marry? Is this a person of character? Next one's this. Repent of sin. If you are single, do not miss this opportunity. If you have the few desire marriage in your future, repent of sin now. Let me tell you why this is so critical. When there is a single guy and a single gal and they have single people issues and sin rampant in their lives and then they get married... Marriage is not a solution. 
if there are people who have married people problems, if you dig long enough, and usually not too far, you will find that they don't actually have married people problems. They had single people problems that they brought into the marriage, and now they're married people problems, but they could have been resolved when they were single people. And when you bring single people problems into a marriage, it is not 5 plus 5 equals 10. It multiplies. 5 times 5 equals 25. It just gets bigger. Repent of sin now. Deal with your addiction now. Get rid of your proclivities now. Turn it over to Jesus now. It will make you competent for marriage in your future if that is what you desire and want to pursue in your life. Now, last thing is this before we're done. What if I'm single and unhappy? Okay, Jason, you said it's a gift. It doesn't feel like a gift to me. I'm, I'm single. I really desire marriage. I do not think I have the gift of singleness. I really desire marriage. I'm not finding someone I should be married to. What do I do about that? Okay, two things. First one is this. Admit the pain. Admit that you wish you had someone in your life. Go ahead. Talk to God about it. Tell your friends about it. Let, admit that the pain is there. Don't mask it. It's, it's not ungodly to desire marriage. Marriage is a good thing. Don't make an idol out of it. Trust Jesus. But it's okay to desire marriage. So admit that the pain and the desire are there. Acknowledge it. Second is this. Trust God. Trust God with that. Trust God when He says that being single is a good thing. Trust God when He says that He will work this season out for your good because He loves you. Trust God who says, even though you are single, you are not alone because never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Trust God who says, yeah, even if you get married, you're still going to have troubles because marriage is a good thing. It is not the ultimate thing. I am the ultimate thing. Trust God that He is the ultimate thing. See your single season as an opportunity to build your faith in Christ and hand your future over to Him. If you are single and you carry that burden alone, you are making yourself responsible for the outcome of your life. That is a horrible burden to bury to carry. Hand that burden over to God. Trust your future to Him. Let Him carry that for you and walk with Him during your single season of life and let the gospel saturate your heart. The gospel that God loves you and accepts you and the ultimate wedding is still waiting to come in heaven. Repent of the idolatry that comes with our culture. And trust that Jesus is enough to satisfy you regardless of your relationship status. Make it real to yourself through prayer, through corporate worship, through the sacraments, through Christian community in your group. Make the gospel real and drive it deeply into your heart that you will find joy and contentment in your current relationship status and season and realize that Jesus' love is enough for you. Because He's the ultimate thing. He's the ultimate thing your heart desires more than marriage, more than acceptance, because in Him, the eyes of approval that you desire, well, you have it from the only one in the universe who matters, God Himself. We'll pick it up there next Sunday. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I thank you that we have this scripture to guide those of us who are single in your truth. I ask that all of us will be able to rest and feel a deep sense of peace and joy, regardless of relationship status, knowing that marriage on earth is only for this earth. It's a foretaste. It's a foreshadow. It's there to point the eternal wedding supper of the Lamb. I ask that this future glory, this longing will live in our hearts so that we will find satisfaction in you and in you alone. For everyone who's single, it is such a challenge to be single and wise when it comes to seeking marriage in our generation. I ask that you will give them a spirit of humility, a spirit of wisdom, and a spirit of discernment as they seek marriage. For those who've chosen to remain single, I'm thankful that they have seen this as a gift for you. 
that they will find joy and contentment in their single life. But Lord, for all of us, wherever this lands with our relationship status, please give us the wisdom to know how to apply what we've learned today and the courage to do it through Jesus Christ who loves us. We ask it. Amen.